Well, as I mentioned earlier in this series, uh, I had this compulsion when I was younger that I needed to be telling people about Jesus. I mean, I was a good pastor's kid, and uh, I really don't like, have to do this. But I found it really forced and very uncomfortable. And so when I was a teenager, I was about 15 or 16 years old, uh, my first job outside of, you know, delivering papers and stuff was working in a warehouse. It was a retail warehouse, which most of you, if you're under the age of 40, have no idea what that is. But it's a warehouse where you actually can go in and buy stuff at the front of the warehouse, right? And so I worked there for several years. You know, I'd go after school and I would work. And I had a friend, I call him an acquaintance, a co-worker who, you know, we got along and I would call him a casual friend. We didn't hang out outside of work, but we worked together pretty well. And my job when working in the back was uh, unloading trucks, stocking shelves, and, uh, you know, doing all that good stuff so that people could come in and order uh, what they wanted to have. And I remember thinking, and I, I can't remember the guy's name actually, it's been so long, um, but I remember thinking that, you know what, I need to talk to him about Jesus. He's not a person who knows him. i got to have a spiritual conversation. I thought, well, I don't know how to do that. That's really intimidating. I'm not sure how that's going to happen. But I was determined that I was going to have this conversation. And so we were in the warehouse, and we were working. And as I reflected, by the way, I realized that's when we didn't have safety. You know how we loaded and did the overstock? You climbed up the shelves. You straddled like this. And then the person down would throw boxes up, and you would catch it, and you know, you'd put them on the shelf. This is our safety uh, kind of thing. And that's what we were doing. We were stocking shelves. We were doing overstock. We're throwing this, and we're having a conversation. The whole time I'm planning, like, how can I make this conversation work? I need to get it around to spiritual things where I could, uh, I wanted to ma arrange the conversation so that I could naturally talk about Jesus. And uh, I remember doing this. We I carefully guided the conversation, take great intentionality with my language, and we talked as we worked, and finally I got to where I needed it, and I said my spiritual statement, my opening remark, or my question, and I'll never forget what happened. He was up on the top, I was down on the floor, and he paused everything he was doing, he was holding this box, and he did not say, tell me more. He did not say, I need Jesus. Do you know what he said? He said, well, you manipulated that conversation pretty well. <laughs> Caught in the act. And it reinforced to me why I don't evangelize. Maybe you've experienced something like that. You know, where you were simply unsure. Like, I don't know, when do I say something? Jesus doesn't seem to come up naturally when you're talking about football, unless you're talking about the Cowboys because they're God's team, then it comes up a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it it's often doesn't happen, right? I mean, people, quite frankly, often don't seem interested. I mean, how many times have you been at school and your classmates are like, man, we should have a talk about Jesus at the lunch table, right? It doesn't come up naturally. Like, when do you do this? We don't want to seem preachy, um, and we might really care about someone, but maybe they're just really resistant, to this idea. They don't even want to have those conversations. And we have this kind of interesting dilemma. We all have met and know people who are so bold with talking about Jesus that they actually see, we've actually seen people turned off by it, right? You run into people like that. And yet, I'll bet you, every single person in this room has gone home and said, oh, I wish I'd have been a little bolder. I wish I would have said something. Oh, the opportunity was right there and I didn't say something. So what do we do? When do we do it? Well, I think there's a great story from the life of the early church that I think will help us. And I'm going to go through the story pretty quickly. Um, but I think there's three ideas that come out of it. And I want to give you three tips this morning, practical tips that hopefully will help you in this regard. So the story begins like this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to to Gaza. Now, just to pause. So this is Philip. He's actually one of two that are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, this is not um, the Apostle Philip. So when you read the list of the 12 people that Jesus invited to be his disciples, that's not the Philip they're talking about. This guy is called Philip the Evangelist. So he was actually one of the original deacons. He was one of the ones when they said, hey, we need people that will manage uh, distributing food. He's one of the guys that they picked. Man of integrity. And so 
this is the person that God taps on the shoulder. And so he started out. By the way, I love the directions. Go to the desert road. That's it. That'd be, but I, I realized that sounds really weird until he came to Seifert, and people say, well, just go to Stein Highway and go there. You're like, oh, okay, I know where that is. So he obviously knew where this was, and he went. He started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandrake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Now, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Which, by the way, means he had some means because people didn't just walk around with their, you know, their tablet and a book. I mean, you had a scroll. It was, it was a big deal. And the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. I, I, I you see this frequently through this entire thing. You see these little words, then. Okay? So then, Philip ran up to the chariot. He heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. Well, how can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this was the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then... Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stop in the way of being, stand in the way of me being baptized? And so he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Great story. Great result. And we look at that and go, okay. If God told me to go to someone and he had his Bible open and was reading John 3, 16 and said to me, what does this mean? I could be an evangelist, right? I mean, if it was that simple. But it's actually, there's a lot more to it than that. I think there's some principles here that should help us across the board. So let me, let me take a look at them. Here's the first. When do we share the good news? Here's the first principle. It begins by being available. Because if this is not true, then everything else we talk about is kind of pointless. And when I say available, I don't mean the available that we often talk about. If you ever had that fatalistic kind of, well, if God wants to make it happen, he's going to put it right in front of me, right? You know, like we say, well, I mean, he didn't put it right there. The person actually didn't come and open their Bible and to ask me to tell him about Jesus. So I guess Jesus didn't want me to do it. Now, that's not the kind of availability we're talking about, right? Availability basically means I will do whatever you ask me to do, and I am not going to be so busy that I have no time or space to do it. Because when we do that, what we've really said to God, right? If we say, God, okay, I'm available, but I'm really busy. I have a lot to do. So God... You can, you're going to have to do something amazing for me to do this. What we're really telling God is, I'm not all that interested. And here's how I know that. If I told my wife I was available for her anytime, but not Monday to Friday between 8 and 5, because, I mean, that's when I'm working, and uh, not in the evenings because I have meetings on Mondays and Tuesdays, and I play volleyball on Thursdays, um, I'm not really available when I'm at the golf course and by the time I get done, I'm really telling her I'm available on Friday evening between 6 and 8. What would her conclusion be? Yeah, other than kicking me out of the house. I'm, I'm not, her conclusion would be, I'm actually not available. When you're available for someone, what are you telling them? Call me anytime. I'm there for you. I will show up. I will interrupt my day for you. I will change my expectations. I will change my calendar. I will change my schedule because you matter. Philip was available. Look what it says. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I mean, <laughs> basically he said, look, I don't really care what you're doing, Philip. I don't really care what your plans are for today. I don't know, really care what your to-do list is for today. I don't know what you had planned for today. I've got something I need you to do. I want you to go here. I'm not, Philip could have said, well, you know, um, 
I haven't stopped at Walmart yet. I haven't done the lowest trip. So, uh, Jesus, I'll go tomorrow. So what happened? Philip said, all right, I'm in. And then when they get there, he's like, I can just picture him. He kind of gets down to the road. He's traveled. He's walked. This is not just a quick, you know, five-minute thing. He gets to the road, desert road, which means it's not like he's sitting at 7-Eleven or Wawa, right? He's out. He's drinking the last of his water, and he's looking around going, all right. And he sees a chariot, and the Spirit says, go there. Another chance for him to say, yeah, I don't think so. Because, in fact, if it was an Ethiopian eunuch, uh, part of the, um, the court of an important official, it wasn't just a single chariot with a single person, right? Most likely, there was an entourage, a whole group, and they were foreigners. Ethiopia is Africa. These are not people that are like Philip. And he's saying, oh, yeah, go over there. Philip said, all right, I'm in. What do you need, God? See, here's what happens. Too often we say, God, I'm available, but what we are really saying or wanting is that God would give us something to do that will actually not require anything uncomfortable or force us to have a conversation with someone we don't know. It's really what we're saying. God, I'm available, and here's the parameters under which I'm available. God doesn't work that way. Let me give you a tip. How do we do this? How do we become available? Easy tip that you can practice starting this week. Simply this. Engage one more person each day in conversation than you would usually do. That's it. And if you're the kind of person who talks to everybody, we'll talk to one more. And if you're the person who talks to nobody, talk to one. And this is not that hard. It means instead of going straight inside and driving into your garage and letting the door close behind you when you see your neighbor out, just stop. Go over and talk to him for a couple minutes. How are you doing? Instead of being on the phone, texting when you're in the doctor's office, put it down, turn to the person next to you and say, what are you here for? What's wrong with you? I don't know. Ask him something. I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> Engage your waitress in conversation that doesn't include get me my food. Right? Just have a conversation. Instead of texting your friend, pick up the phone, call him. Just one, one extra conversation day. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be big. What you're doing is you're making the practice of saying to God, I am available for whatever it is that you want to do. I'm just going to start looking around and engaging in one extra conversation a day. And if you do it by 9 o'clock, you don't have to talk to anybody the rest of the day. Okay, that's number one. Second thing that I see that I think is really helpful is practice curiosity. Do you notice that God gave Philip no script? Do what, what, you remember what his instructions were? Go be by that chariot. That was it. He didn't have Romans Road. Had, Romans hadn't been written yet. He didn't have a tract. He didn't carry a uh, pocket New Testament. Um, he didn't know these people. There was no relationship. God just said, go be next to the chariot. That was literally the extent of his instructions. And so what did Philip do? He just was curious. Comes up. And look, it says he ran up, so he was actually really engaged. And he just says, what you reading? Does it make sense? Like, just, just being curious. All he did was ask a question. When I, was, when I became a pastor, and I was being coached uh, by my pastor at the time, he told me simply, be curious. We live in a world where people are so preoccupied with themselves, they have no desire or awareness to be curious. They talk about themselves incessantly. And you know this because you've sat across the table from people like this. They don't actually genuinely want to know what's going on in other people's lives. Not really. How are you doing? Good. Oh, yeah, my week's been really bad. In fact, here's, and then off they go. Most people ask you how you're doing so that they get to tell you how they're doing. That's just the way people are. It's our selfish natures. What genuine curiosity does is says, I am genuinely interested in you. Practice curiosity. It's all Philip did. The entire door to everything that happened from that point on was just Philip saying, hey, what you reading? Do you get it? Do you understand it? 
what if he had said because he didn't know what he was reading it wasn't like he said oh yeah i can see he's reading isaiah you know it's like what are you reading he's like, as a matter of fact here's what i'm reading he was just curious so let me give you a practical tip okay here's practical tip number two practice the principle of the second question you're like what on earth is that this is the principle that makes all the difference in conversation with another person because when you're having a conversation with another person the question that makes all the difference is never the first question it's the second let me give you an illustration you come in here on a Sunday morning or you're at work and you see someone and you say hey how are you doing and you get one of those pauses they kind of go yeah, I'm doing all right. And a lot of times we think, okay, good, I'm done. If I walk away now, I don't have to talk to him about anything else. Do you know what opens the door to genuine conversation? It's question number two. Really, it doesn't sound like you had the perfect week. What's going on in your life? And all of a sudden the doors begin to crackle. It's because what people do, and you'll, you'll see this, is right, Philip follows up. What are you reading? What are you understanding? And he, and he kind of leans into this. And this idea of asking the second question is just a practical tip to practice curiosity because what people do is they'll answer your first question and they are not going to go any further till they know you care. And I know this. I've experienced the other end of this more times than I can count where someone will say, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing this and I do it. And I, I literally, I'm opening the door so they can follow up. And they go, oh, that's nice. And they begin to talk about themselves. And you know what happens? The door goes, <laughs> slams right back up. I'm like, all right, I guess they don't care. I'm not telling them anymore about my life. But when they ask the follow-up question, oh, what's going on? Tell me more about that. There is something inside us that God has wired for us to want to engage with people. And if we practice curiosity by just saying, okay, tell me more. By the way, this isn't a Christian thing. This isn't a church thing. This is a people thing. You want to engage with your teenagers better? Ask them a second question. How was your school today? Yeah, it was all right. Really? What was the best thing that happened today? What was the worst thing that happened today? All of a sudden, second question is followed by number three and number four. You can do this with your friends. Guys, if you're dating a girl and you want her to like you, Ask second questions. It'll be amazing. This will put you ahead of all your friends who can only talk about themselves. Ask second question. Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to put you in a place to talk to someone. Just be curious. Hey, explain that a little more. I don't understand what you just said. Can you unpack that a little bit for me? How'd you feel when that happened? People are longing to talk. And I'll say this because when someone told me, be curious, ask questions, the biggest pushback I always get is, well, I don't want to offend them. Do you know I've been doing this for 20 years? I have yet to have someone tell me off. No, your business. I'm not talking to you. Never happened. Not everybody shares to the same depth, but everybody wants to be heard. Principle number two. Here's the third one. Use connecting points. After the eunuch invited Philip into his chariot, and he reads Philip a part of Isaiah, and he's confused, right? He has questions. He's like, I don't understand. So the, Philip, the eunuch says to Philip, so tell me, please, who's the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And let's be honest, it doesn't usually work like this. Most of the time, right? I'm not going home, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have one more conversation. And I walk over to my neighbor's house, and he's sitting on his porch, and he's got his coffee and a Bible sitting in front of him, and he's reading, and he says, hey, yeah, what you reading? Well, you know, and it, j it just doesn't usually work that way, right, if we're honest. But there are all kinds of connecting points, right? Philip is looking for something. When he says, hey, what are you reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And he's like, well, here's what I'm reading. You got any light to shed on the subject? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. And then they get into this whole dialogue. We want to get to the point where we're connecting their lives with someone who's bigger than their life. That's all we're trying to do. So here's the tip. Tip number three. Connect their story to God's story using your story. So let me, um, let me unpack this a little bit. Remember when we, about a couple weeks ago, do you remember when we looked at this, we said that the entire scriptures is the story of God? Right? We talked about this. We said this is what the Bible is all about. It's creation. It was created perfect under God's rule. We, as humanity, sinned, Adam and Eve. And so it broke everything. And now we want to live under our own rule, our own way, with our own stuff. 
And so God has this whole plan to redeem, to intervene, to bring us back to himself. And he's looking to restore the joy, the freedom, the peace that we have with the ultimate restoration being at the end. Right? Do you remember that? That's the story of God. Do you know every single person, including you, has that exact same story? Think about it this way. Our story or the person you're talking to. They have an origin story, a creation story that says, well, what made me? What shaped me? Who am I? Why am I the way I am? And you'll hear this in conversations all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm just like my father. I'm just like my mother. I'm nothing like my father. You know, they treated me like this, and so I did this. Or you know what? I'm only like this because my boss did this. Or I'm only like this because my parents said X, right? Everybody has a story as to how they got to be the way they are. It might not be an informed story. It might be wrong, but they've got a story. Believe it. Everybody has a belief about why the world is broken and how they desire justice. Every person, without exception, says something's not right. Here's what's broken. Here's the, they have opinions on it, right? Maybe and and who's to blame, and what should happen. And you know this because all you have to do is watch the news. Well, the, the, this is broken. I mean, we just need less immigrants, or oh, we need to have more of the more immigrants come in, or you know, the financial situation is broken. You, we can't trust our government, or you know what, my job is a wreck, and it's all the fault of my boss. You know, it, and everybody has a story of something that's broken, right? I've got no more health. My health is wrecked, but that's because my job made me lift, you know, stuff out of the back of the truck for 20 years, and now my back is wrecked. Like everybody's got a story, and you hear these things all the time. You can you can hear them in the, in the people you talk to. Everybody's got this story of. Well, something's broken. People will tell you how they should be and who's to blame. And who should be punished. Because that's free. In other words, everybody's longing for redemption. In other words, it's broken. Who is going to fix it? Maybe it's personal growth. Maybe it's education. Maybe it's political reform. Maybe it's just a different philosophy. Someone or something is what they think will rescue this. It's usually out there if they don't know Jesus. Right? If you don't know Jesus, the problem is out there. The issue is out there. The way it's going to get fixed is out there. It's not here. But people, everyone has a solution or a savior to their problem. And everybody has a picture of what it should be like if everything was as it should be. And if you asked someone that question, they would have an answer for you. Well, what should it look like? Well, everybody should love each other. Well, what does that look like? Well, that means everybody should do this. Or everybody should do this. Or everybody should do this. You hear this all the time. People talking about what, you know, if your job was perfect, what would that look like? Well, my boss would get off my back. They would pay me a little bit more. Like, there's a picture. How would your family be perfect? Well, my daughter would call me more. Or my mother would leave me alone a little bit more. I'd have more freedom. They all have a picture of what it would look like if everything was perfect. So, if you want to be curious, just ask and pay attention to any one of these. Because in any conversation, when you begin to ask the second question, you're going to start getting little views into their own story, where they came from, what their origins are. You're going to get pictures on what they think is wrong with the world. You're going to have pictures in there of what they think should happen, how justice should come. You're going to little see pictures in there about what they picture the world would be like. So just ask questions. Right? They ask one thing, you're like, oh, tell me about that. Sounds like your family upbringing was a little bit rough. But well, away they go. Or you know what? If it would only be like, why do you think that would make it better? What would happen if that happened tomorrow? What happens if that never happens? Right? Just ask a question, every one of these. And then what you begin to do is say, that's just like my life. I was broken. But that's not how God made me. That's not how God made you. And the cool part in all this is you're not being preachy. You're letting the Holy Spirit lead. Like, I'm not trying to tell you this is a program. It's just a way, some tips of saying, okay, God, you're the one who's leading. And Philip and the eunuch, the entire thing was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. We said, Philip, I need you to go. Because I know when this person is going to cross right here, this is where I want you to be. And then when Philip showed up, he said, go have a conversation, because I know what he's reading. I know what's going on in his life. I know what he's looking for. And you're the guy that I've asked to have this conversation. God knew all that stuff. All Philip had to do was kind of follow the logical train. That's all God's asking of us. Say, just be available. Be curious. And then as you're being curious, say, look, I hear your story. I have the same kind of things. And I can connect it. And you don't have to share it all at once. It's all based on relationship and time. And the vast majority of the time, you're going to have multiple conversations about multiple things 
where they begin to trust you as you share your story with them. The Holy Spirit is literally the best connector of people and times of anybody. So when are we inviting? Begin. We learn when by just making ourselves available. And then by being curious, asking the second question and looking for connecting points. It'll involve a little bit of conversational risk, but less than you think. Less than I think. We're going to talk about one more thing after communion, but before we do that, I think this is the perfect time to celebrate communion because when we do this, we are celebrating Christ's death and resurrection. And we are feeling the weight of our sin and the greatness of his love and grace as reflected in his story in our lives. And the good news is it's available to all people. And it's a reminder that we have a responsibility to spread that good news to all people.